Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first real lecture for critical reasoning. Uh, I am your instructor, Greg Damico. Of course, I want to start the uh, lecture off today by thinking about the nature of critical reasoning itself. One helpful way that uh, some instructors have been inclined to think about critical reasoning is by phrasing it as thinking about thinking, thinking about thinking. So that might be thinking about your own thinking, you might be thinking about somebody else's thinking. And of course, the point of thinking about somebody else's thinking, <laughs> or your own, is to try to assess it, to evaluate it, to um, have some sense of whether that thinking was good or bad, or misleading or ineffective. The uh, various standards that we might try to use to measure thinking um, are various. We will, of course, be talking about this as we go on, but, but the, the, the first lesson I think to keep in the back of your mind is that there are standards for this. We can say of certain kinds of thinking that they're good or, or they're bad. Um, <clears throat> measuring by some objective standard or other. Now, that's not to say that critical thinking is about limiting your freedom of thought, right? The, the point is not that we're not free to think what we like. As a matter of fact, free thinking and creative thinking are often um, useful and beneficial for philosophy and for critical thinking in general, um, rather than the reverse. But the point is rather that, uh, you know, while there's no limitation really at all on, on what you think, there are limitations and interesting rules and things to be considered when it comes to how you think, right? And that's really what this class is about. I'm, I'm going to have very little to say about what you ought to think, but I'm going to have uh, <clears throat> much more to say about how to think. Right? If you are inclined to have one opinion or another, then we want to have reasons for those opinions and so on. Um, and the way that that structure works, the way that one thought can be a reason for another and so on, is what I want to focus on and what, what I'll be talking about um, today. Um, before I get to that, though, I want to start with a few ideas about negative uh, things, things that can get in the way of critical reasoning, what critical reasoning is not. Um, so first and foremost, this is maybe an easy one, but when we are ruled by our emotions, that is certainly one way in which critical thinking can be hampered or hindered. Um, clearly, if I'm uh, acting out of anger or making decisions out of fear or sadness or whatever, spite, then I'm not thinking critically, right? I'm, I'm merely letting my emotions decide for me uh, how, I shall, how I shall lead my life or how I shall think. Um, incidentally, this is uh, the same thought that affected Kant when Kant was talking about ethics and he said that um, free action has to be action that's done from a particular sort of motive. Uh, and if you're acting because of emotion, then you're, you're sort of literally not free, right? Because you're, you're sort of subjecting your body to the whims of your emotions, um, where those emotions don't really represent your uh, essential self as a rational, free-thinking, autonomous being. Um, emotions are familiar. Uh, <laughs> certainly, I'm not immune to the um, the phenomenon of acting on emotions. That this is something that happens to us all, and there may be even times when it's it's not so terrible to do that. Uh, but it does seem that just in the nature of acting on emotion, you're you're sort of spurning uh, or eschewing critical thought. And of course, this thought this class is about is about critical thought rather than about emotion. Uh, the second 
less familiar case, perhaps, is when we are ruled by biases. Um, now, again, biases are, are similar to emotions in that, in that they're going to act in a way that's antithetical to critical reason, but they have important differences from emotions. Um, most important of those is that biases are subconscious, where emotions typically are conscious. It's probably also possible for emotions sometimes to be subconscious. I think it is a, a genuine phenomenon that people will emerge from the psychoanalyst's office having discovered some important emotional truths about themselves. But in general, we know what we're feeling, whereas biases are definitely operating at, at a lower level of, of awareness. In fact, um, they're often beyond our awareness altogether. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, if I have a, a sort of bias against a certain class of people, for example, this is probably all too familiar these days, then I may act in a certain way with regard to them or with regard to people not in that group and may not even be aware of the sort of preferential or, or uh, discriminatory treatment that I'm engaging in. We will have much more to say about bias soon. In fact, that's the topic of the next, the next lecture. But for now, I just want to put it out there that besides emotions that get in the way of critical thinking, there's also this other class of psychological entities that can, can obscure our thought. Um, and we're going to call them cognitive biases. Okay, um, well, if those things are, are the sorts of factors that, that compose bad thinking or non-critical thinking, then let's say a word about what, what our topic really is, which is good thinking or critical thinking. In a word, the standards by which we want to try to assess our thought and the thought of others uh, come down to rationality. Rationality, right? We want, we want to be rational in our thoughts and in our actions uh, <clears throat> when we accuse someone of being irrational, that's supposed to be a kind of serious charge. Uh, and we, we think that that's something to be avoided, and it is. And so the, the intuition is that we ought to be able to say something about what it is to be rational. And indeed, much of this class is about elucidating that, that very idea. Namely that there are some objective things we can say about what it is to think rationally and what it is to think irrationally. Um, before we go any further, it's probably worth saying that for the purposes of this class, I'm going to be taking the world to have a sort of definite character, right? Um, and in such a way that every statement we make about it is either true or false. Now, I think, you know, at first blush, that probably sounds reasonable and, and uncontroversial. Uh, <clears throat> either um, there's an odd number of stars in the sky or there isn't. Either the Earth is round or it isn't. Either the dodo has gone extinct or it has not, etc. But, of course, there are other statements that we often make that we sometimes think don't uh, lend themselves to this kind of strict true or false thinking. Uh, in general, I'm, we will be avoiding um, uh, sentences that, that fall into that sort of class. However, there are two, two important caveats to make here. The first is that at the end of the course, we will actually be exploring some, some thoughts in the area of values, ethical values, aesthetic values, legal values. Uh, and the second caveat is that um, some of those things, to the extent that we talk about them, we will, at least for this class, be assuming that they do admit of this kind of, this kind of uh, bivalent behavior, as the logician might put it, i.e. That, that such claims, despite whatever baggage they may bring with them, despite whatever thoughts they may conjure up, nevertheless are either true or false, just like, just like any not ordinary statement about about the world or about uh, something physical. Okay. Um, 
so um, as we go on, we'll, we'll use words like belief and judgment and opinion. And those things are, are meant to be mental entities, right? Those are things that appear in people's heads. I have my beliefs, you have your beliefs, I have my opinions, you make your judgments. But the, 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 the sort of guiding idea is that we have these opinions and these thoughts and beliefs and judgments about the world as it is, right? I make myself sort of pictures of the world. I, I come to believe certain things about the world. And of course the belief is mine, but the belief that I'm making is about what's out there, what's really true and objective out there in the world. Um, and of course someone else may make a different belief about that same corner of reality. But um, the point I wanna make here is just that you know, it's, it's a little bit misleading to say that, well, I've got my beliefs and you've got yours, and we don't have to have any kind of disagreement. Because in general, the things that I make my beliefs and judgments and opinions about are things in the world, the same things that you make your judgments and beliefs and opinions about, right? And so if I look at a pile of rocks and form a judgment that there are six rocks there, and you look at that same pile of rocks and form a judgment that there are seven rocks there, well, <clears throat> I've got my belief in my head and you've got your belief in your head. So far, there's no, there's no sort of problem. But the problem arises when we recall that we're making these judgments about that one single pile, objective pile of rocks over there, right? And so either there are six rocks only or there are seven, right? Or perhaps, or perhaps both we, we've both miscounted and there are five or eight or something. But nevertheless, there's some truth. There's some reality there that we're, that we're trying to latch onto in our own ways, right? I've got my, my beliefs in my head again, and you've got yours and yours. But, but again, they're reaching out to the world in such a way that, that it makes sense to talk about our beliefs clashing or, or being in conflict, um, et cetera. Okay, um, and while we're on this topic, I, I wanna say a bit more about subjectivity versus objectivity. <clears throat> These words get tossed around a lot, uh, roughly speaking, the subjective is supposed to be something that has to do with inner feeling or inner personality or my own thoughts or whatever. And the objective is supposed to be something that's out there in, in the real world. Um, I think that's more or less useful for, for ordinary purposes. I want to be a little bit more precise for us in this class. And the way I'm going to split the terms, um, this is following Moore and Parker in their book, Critical Thinking. I'm gonna do it like this. We're going to say, well, the objective, right? The objective describes claims whose truth doesn't depend on what anybody believes uh, about it, right? Whereas subjective claims uh, can only be true or false uh, dependent on what is believed about them. So for example, um, I, I think, I, I assume that most claims will come out to be objective by this standard. The earth is round, that seems to be an objective statement uh, because, and given this new slightly more precise usage, the world is round is an objective claim because uh, it's round quite regardless, quite independent of what anybody believes about the shape of the earth. So for example, even if it were true that uh, a thousand years ago, most people believed that the earth was flat, and I think probably that's not true, but suppose it were true that a thousand years ago, most people believed the earth was flat. Well, the instinct is, the intuition is, that doesn't mean that the earth back then was flat, right? That doesn't, wishing doesn't make it so, believing doesn't make it so. The earth was round even then, despite what the popular opinion was. Right? And that is exactly the hallmark of objectivity. It's to say that the thing that makes this statement true is something about the world. And of course, you know, that, that's to say nothing at all about what, what many people believe, whether they believe it or not, and so on. Right? So it may, for example, um, be a truth um, awaiting discovery that, uh, you know, that. Uh, who knows that um, that 
some distant planet has five moons orbiting it. But the fact that nobody has any beliefs about it now doesn't change the fact that it's true now and probably has been true for a long time. Right? And again, that's, that's what we mean by objective. So something subjective would be something whose truth does depend on what people believe about it. Some people think that uh, moral claims are like this, claims to do with ethics. Again, we will be coming back to these at the end of the course. Um, but other people think that they're not like that. For example, you know, um, <clears throat> it might seem to be a matter of opinion that, uh, you know, whether it's appropriate to put to death people convicted of capital crimes. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it isn't, right? Maybe, maybe there is some objective truth about morality out there. Notice that the mere fact that people disagree about the uh, ethics of capital punishment, as of course they do, doesn't by itself prove anything, right? Because after all, people disagree about objective matters all the time. We can disagree about the number of rocks in the pile. We can disagree about who killed John F. Kennedy. We can disagree about the shape of the earth, but none of those disagreements changes the fact that these questions that we're talking about are perfectly objective, okay? And lots of philosophers, as we'll see again later, um, think that moral questions are like this, that, that even though they certainly bear disagreement and in fact widespread and fruitful and, and uh, vast disagreement, nevertheless, they might very well be questions that have objective answers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> maybe a, a better candidate for a subjective truth is something to do with um, uh, gustatory considerations, matters of taste, right? If I like, um, you know, if I like coffee and you don't, um, then we seem to have a sort of difference of opinion about the value, the gustatory value, aesthetic value of coffee. Um, and yet, it's not clear at all that we'd want to say that there's some objective truth there to be wrong or right about. Um, I, I'm unlikely to think that I've latched onto some truth about the value of coffee that you're missing out on, or vice versa. Right? And so we might think that whether coffee is tasty is a subjective question and, and, and one group will answer it one way and another group will answer it another way and they can both in effect be right right because there is no objective question about um, the the ultimate value of, of coffee it's, it's just not objective in that way all right um to close out this lecture i, I this sort of introductory lecture i want to turn to the notion of argument because arguments um, are a kind of central piece of philosophy, certainly for critical reasoning, and they help answer the question about what rational thought really is. We said before that the goal of critical thinking is to be rational, and uh, an argument is in a, a kind of encapsulation of rational thought, and so it's worth our time to think about arguments. There are, of course, many other uses of the term argument. Um, people talk about getting into arguments with others uh, and so on. But we're going to use the term in a restricted way in this class. And whenever we use the term in this class, we should use it to mean a certain structured set of claims. Uh, and in particular, there are, there are two parts. There's a set of starting assumptions or premises. And there's a conclusion. And the idea of the argument is that these premises actually give us reason to believe in the conclusion or that the conclusion is true. Right? So an argument is an attempt to prove some claim. It's kind of, um, it's kind of a, a noteworthy fact, and maybe it seems too obvious to be worth mentioning, but, but Aristotle mentioned this a long time ago. He said, you know, it's, it, it's a remarkable thing that certain statements actually give us reasons to believe in the truth of other claims. Right? So for example, if you know that, uh, that Fido is a dog and that all dogs uh, are mammals, uh, 
right? Those two pieces of information give us reason to believe a third piece of information, which is that Fido is a mammal, right? Because it can't be true, both that Fido is a dog and that all dogs are mammals, unless it's also true that Fido is a mammal. This is some new distinct piece of information. Of course, you know, you might be inclined to say that it's somehow already encoded in the premises with which we began. Um, the idea that Fido is a mammal is sort of implicit in the two claims that Fido is a dog and that dogs are mammals. Nevertheless, this conclusion that Fido is a mammal is a, is a new claim, and it's something that's uh, distinct from the premises that support it, and yet, uh, the premises seem to prove the conclusion in an important sense, right? They seem to be connected to the truth of the conclusion in this kind of rationally compelling way. That's, that's the whole point of an argument, okay? Uh, we will have much, much, much more to say about arguments as the class goes on. That's, that's certainly a central piece of this class. But for now, I want to just say a quick word about, you know, what what ought the premises to be like if they're going to do this job of lending credence to the conclusion? There are two main features that premises ought to have. The first is that they need to be true, right? Uh, whenever you see um, someone actually making an argument for something, which is of course not as often as one might wish, um, an opponent will often criticize it by saying, well, I don't even agree with those premises, premises with which you've begun, right? I don't, I don't accept the truth of those things that you're saying, right? So if I make an argument that we, um, that we ought not to have capital punishment by starting from the assumption that killing is always wrong, you might get off the boat right there, right? You might say, well, wait, I don't, I don't accept that premise that killing is always wrong. Um, I think killing in self-defense is okay. I think killing the germs in your mouth is okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's always a reasonable criticism of an argument to make to say that the, the premises with which someone began, one or all of them, um, are false. And the second thing that we want to demand of our premises if they're going to be helpful in establishing some conclusion um, by any measure of certainty is that they ought to be relevant to the conclusion, right? They need to be materially connected to the truth of the conclusion. Uh, and the other sort of main criticism that you often see people making of other people's arguments is the so what response, right? They say, yeah, yeah, I accept all these points that you're making, and yet they don't seem to establish the conclusion that you want to make, right? You know, it just doesn't follow from the fact that, um, you know, some Mexicans got uh, jobs in the agriculture industry in California last fall. It just doesn't follow from that fact that the immigrants are taking all our jobs and we ought to be stricter about who gets into this country, right? I mean, it simply, it simply doesn't follow, okay? Now, it's, maybe it's connected, maybe it's not totally irrelevant, but clearly, if the argument's going to be good and tight, we, we demand a pretty strong connection between the premises and the conclusion. The, this, the toy example that we mentioned before about Fido being a mammal um, has that quality where the conclusion is, is really inescapable if the premises are, are accepted. Now, it's not always true that we're going to demand that level of, um, of tightness between premises and conclusion. And in fact, it's not true in general that, that whenever you make an argument, you ought to have that kind of structure. Sometimes arguments are made where the premises are meant only to provide a certain sort of some reason, not overwhelmingly compelling reason to believe the conclusion. And so there are both kinds of arguments. We'll come back to that as well. But clearly we wanna hang on to this idea that the premises should be relevant to the conclusion. Okay, that's it for now. The next uh, time I chat at you, it will be about about biases. So I will I will see you then.